Welcome to Conversation. Our guest today for the first of a two-part chat is the brilliant and celebrated actor, stage and screen, Marion Seldes. Conversations is Lehman College's series of discussions with major theater and musical figures of our time. Welcome to Conversations, Marion. Thank you very much. I feel that we, we've known each other a long time, but we haven't at I all. Know. Uh, it's because We've there are no degrees of separation. Of each other, haven't yes. We? yes, I feel honored to have you on the show today. I'm, Thank you. I'm a fan, and I'm looking forward to getting to know you just a little bit better today. I uh, think you will. Good. We only met recently during uh, my show Cornberry, which is played uh, off Broadway. And for those who don't know your career, which are very few people who don't know your career, in 1967 you won a Tony for. Edward Albee's Delicate Balance. Uh, I have to read this because it's, it's voluminous, your career. <laughs> um, you appeared, also appeared in Tiny Hours, Three Tall Women, uh, the play about the baby. I'm sure I've forgotten some shows of, of Albee's there. You have had four Tony nominations. Uh, you've, uh, you've received an Obie Drama Desk Awards. Uh, you are, uh, you're in the Theater Hall of Fame. Uh, you did. 179 episodes of the uh, CBS Radio Mystery Theater. Yes, I did. I think I heard all of them. <laughs> I was you were a little boy. I was a little boy, <laughs> and I loved it. <laughs> it's hard to believe I was a little boy, but I was. Um, I saw you in lots of television drama of the Golden Age, and you come from a, a, a distinguished background. Your dad was uh, the journalist Gilbert Seldes. And your mother was Alice Waldron Hall. Alice Wadhams well, Hall. Parents of very different backgrounds. Yes. Uh, uh, what was it like growing up in that household? Heavenly. I loved growing up. I had a wonderful childhood because our family was very close. My brother and I are still very close in, in contact with each other almost every day. I grew up thinking that my fa mother and father's friends were much more interesting than my friends. <laughs> and we were never asked how was school, but we would have dinner together every night, almost every night. And when we did, the conversation would include us as adults. And that's rare now, I think. And I found both my parents fascinating and I still do. I have a theory that if you love people, they never die. They're in your life forever. And my parents are in my <laughs> life forever. My father had a great deal to do with early television, with CBS in the 1930s, before there was any um, commercial television or ads in television. My father was the director of television programs for CBS. And uh, I was around a lot then because he would let us come to the studio. And um, it was simply wonderful because we had lots of friends, you see, because we had a television set. So that's why we had lots of friends. <laughs> <laughs> My brother and I got more and more friends as, we, as television got more and more interesting. You know what I mean? And, uh, and my father was fascinated by all what he called the lively arts. He wrote a book called The Seven Lively Arts. And, and it were, there were more than seven, of course, but he included the comic strip, the film, vaudeville, until the end of his life. He was still writing another book when his life ended about what the audience is interested in. That book had a tremendous influence in, in Western culture. Tremendous. It did. It did. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, as far afield as uh, Andy Warhol. And, I uh, think so, yes. Uh, very important. Your mother was very different, of a very different background, that is. Well, yes, my mother, my father was, uh, my father's father came over from uh, Russia because of the pogroms, and my mother was was an Episcopalian, well, her name was Alice. And my, my father, when he met her, said, I don't think you're like Alice. I'm going to call you Amanda. 
and he decided right away to marry her. He loved her, and it was a wonderful marriage because he always loved her, and I think she always loved him, and I think that's rare, too. When did you know that you wanted to be involved in the theater? My father was also a theater critic for the nation and for a, a, a newspaper called the Journal American and the Dial magazine. So he took my brother and I to the theater a lot. And I would like to tell you that the first time I ever saw the theater, that's when I decided. I don't know when I decided. I think I was shy to tell people when I decided I wanted to be an actress because I didn't look like an actress or sound like an actress. But I wanted to be part of that world, the other world that's on the stage. And I've never regretted it. I've had the most wonderful life. And my father said to me, if you want to be part of the theater, the most interesting part of your life will be the people you work with. And that's true. It's really true. And he, of course, working for the Dial magazine, he knew James Joyce, he knew Picasso, he knew Gertrude Stein, he knew Charlie Chaplin. And I know what he meant. I met some of these people, but I was too young. I just helped serve drinks at what used to be called <laughs> cocktail parties. My brother and I would come in and offer these drinks. Here you were a child and uh, or a young adolescent, and how did you get involved in the theater? What happened? What, what did you do? That's an interesting way of asking me because it, I think it happened to me. I just didn't want to do anything else except a brief dream of being a dancer, a ballet dancer. I don't think that thrilled my parents because he, they felt that that life isn't as interesting as a mm -hmm. life in the theater. But I loved the discipline of the ballet school, of the School of American Ballet. And I missed it when I went into the professional theater. I mean, you never came late for a ballet class, or you couldn't get in. I love somehow being told what to do. Seems funny now. To this day, you move like a, a dancer. Well, I also, when I went to the Neighborhood Playhouse, which is my theater schooling, I studied with Martha Graham, who was an enormous influence on my life. Still, she's alive for me, too, of course. But um, the school I went to, the, 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 the beginning of my schooling was at the Dalton School, which was called a progressive school. That's funny. What, what would you have, a regressive school? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved that school. I told someone the other day that I loved going to school and I couldn't wait to get there and I hated to leave. And this person said to me, goody, goody. <laughs> and I was hurt. I didn't mean it that way. I, th I knew how fortunate I was. I know some people struggle through school. I loved it. And the point I want to tell you about is that every era of history we studied we either wrote a play about or did a play from that time. So that the first play I can remember being in at Dalton was based on a book called The Princess Runs Away, and it was about an Egyptian princess. And I wrote one of the, of the plays we did. Uh, the four of us, four of the girls wrote plays. So I played one of the princesses. Of Clever. course. You've got to remember that. <laughs> if you can't, if you can't, get a part, you write a part. <laughs> and, uh, and so it seemed natural to me to express oneself on the stage, even though these weren't on a stage, they were in the classroom mostly, but uh, to, to live the lives of other people seemed natural to me, and it still does. I'm happier living someone else's life than my own. I think life, daily life, is extremely difficult. 
and daily life when you're not in a play is even more difficult. Because if you're in a play, you can say, I can't do that, I'm in a play. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't seem able to do that if I'm not in a play. Look, right. here I am with you, Bill. That's right. <laughs> uh, my students have that excuse, too. I, I notice uh, they're always in a play <laughs> yeah. in rehearsal. Very good. Yeah. We're very privileged today to have uh, Rick Rogers with us, a producer-director who has been kind enough to share a work in progress uh, called The Third Act of Marion Seldes. And uh, it's... Uh, about your life, and uh, we'd like to, with your permission, to show a piece of that. I um, hope you will. Yes. Uh, well, then let's roll it, Jerry. When he first asked me if I would marry him, I said I thought it wouldn't be right because I thought that the marriage that they had was so, well, special, of course, but in a way, in the public's mind, it was the Canaan's. It was Ruth Gordon and Garson Gay, and I just felt I could. But after five years of being with him, and I knew he wanted it a lot, of course, we were married, and that seemed to me an amazing thing. On the first year of the run, she played a 52-year-old uh, woman, which was about 25 years or 20-some years younger than she. And then she ended up playing the oldest woman in the play, who was 92. And so she ended up playing a character who was 20-some uh, years older than she. It's not about size, it's not about volume, it's not about um, theatricality, it's, it's about energy. It's just about energy and focus and uh, emotional passion. Um, and you, you, you can't mumble with her. You, you can't schlump with her. She's a great beauty and, uh, and she, her you know, her early roots as a, she was a dancer, you know, she studied ballet, and, you know, you see that in her today, the, her, her gracefulness and in her gestures and the way she moves across a room. And she's there one moment and then she's gone. Shaw says in, in Pygmalion, the real difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves, but how she's treated. And I think of that phrase often because how you are treated by other actors is very important in rehearsal. How you are treated at the first reading. I love the third act of my life. And of course it's a, it's a theater phrase, the third act, but I am a theater creature. It's so important what fate hands you, you know. My, my greatest joy in this part of my life is that the parts I play fascinate me, and therefore I know the audience will be interested in them. And thank you for that beautiful work. Thank you. I forgot that it began with my talking about Garson Canaan. That's right. But that really was part of my third act and the best part of my life too to to be around someone who loved the theater more than I do even knew it more than I do has contributed so greatly to it now you you married Garson in 1990 I believe yes. and uh, and Garson Kanan was a dazzling writer director yes and I believe he acted as well. Oh, he? yes, he was a wonderful yeah. actor. How did that affect your life? Well, it made me happy. I was always afraid to use the word happy. People, if you feel it, if you say it, you'll jinx something. But every single day I'd wake up and think, I'll have the day with him. And I still do, I think, what I told you before. 
He's always with me. And for someone like that to give you confidence, he used to say that his father said to him, hold yourself dear. I'd never heard that phrase before. And I used to sort of tell stories to send myself up. He said, don't do that, darling. <laughs> hold yourself dear. And this wasn't about ego or anything. It's about just about how you present yourself to the world, I think. And he made me feel dear and happy and confident. It's wonderful to be around someone like that. Did you ever work with him in a, in a yes, particular project? Oh, yes, yes, I did, I did. And I saw his play, Born Yesterday, three oh. times when I was young because I couldn't get over it. I thought it was so wonderful. I was an acting student then at the Playhouse, and I just kept going and going to see that play. I worked later with Judy Holliday in a play. I was in a play that Garson wrote called A Gift of Time with, uh, with uh, Henry Fonda and Olivia de Havilland about a man that was dying of cancer. It was based on a book called The Death of a Man. And now there's so many plays about people, the end of lives. Then there weren't as many. And it, it was not a successful play, but it was thrilling to be in it and to work <coughs> with him. And then he wrote a play for me to do called Happy Ending. And. Uh, we did that play in Pennsylvania once, and that was thrilling. I, I thought he was a wonderful director. He directed the Diary of Anne Frank, you know. Right. And when, when it was published, the, the authors dedicated the play to Garson. And it was a beautiful, beautiful production. So I was always aware of him as I was growing up in the theater. And also, of course, of Ruth Gordon. Whom she, he was married to. Yes, time. indeed. And so importantly, I, I, I mean, their screenplays. For those screen who don't plays. remember, Ruth Gordon played that, uh, a wonderful role in uh, Rosemary's Baby. It was wonderful. And well, she was a great <laughs> actress. And the first time I ever saw her, she was playing Natasha in The Three Sisters. And I did know Catherine Cornell by then. But I didn't know her, and I thought it was a performance that was so great that now people still talk about her performance as Natasha when they review the play. And since that's what interests me mostly about acting on the theater, in the stage, she was a, a, an inspiration to me. But she was terrific in movies, too. She was terrific in everything, okay. television, everything. She, we've got an Emmy at home right. and the Academy Award. It looks as if I won them. I don't come. <laughs> but I look at them every day. <laughs> All during uh, this period in, in New York, uh, you were, doing, you were uh, doing lots of television work and uh, occasional movies mm -hmm. uh, while you were uh, doing your, your stage work. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you get involved with Edward Albee's work, so, which now you're so identified with? Well, but, but Edward doesn't have anything to do with television and, 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 uh, no, but and the, movies. No, but between Andine, uh, your first Broadway, I think that was your first Broadway play. No, my first Broadway play oh, was wow. Medea with Judith Anderson. A, oh, my God. Another idol of mine. Oh, my God. How oh, could yeah. I forget that one? I did several plays with Judith Anderson, mm. and she was fantastic. Much later, you did Delicate Balance, and mm -hmm. uh, how did you go from the world of Medea and uh, uh, to the world of Edward Albee? How did that happen? Well, you, you don't really go from one to the other. It's, it's like being with you here today. Right. Here we are in a studio with cameras. Right. And if I did too much or moved around, it wouldn't work, would it? I must be sit here and speak with you, right. which is a great pleasure, by the way. But you just adapt to it. I don't 
I'm not a very successful television or movie actress. I, I do tiny little parts in things. Brilliantly. Well, mm -hmm. if, you could, if you could make a, um, what they call a reel of my career in the movies, I think it would last about four and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. We're going to see that reel. Oh, you are? <laughs> you are? In the second part. Are you? Some of it. Some oh, of my it. God. It's remarkable. Well, I don't mean Absolutely to put remarkable. it down because, because I got interesting parts in television and I loved live television in the, in the days when there was Studio One and those, those wonderful hour television shows. The writing was so good. It was wonderful. We're going, to, we're going to see that in the second part. Really? Uh, we're going to see you and Jackie Gleason. I'm curious. I go back to uh, the, the work you did with Edward Albee because mm -hmm. it, it, it was uh, such a remarkable relationship that you've had now with the work of, well, and it goes back uh, quite a way. It goes back to the 1960s yes. when, he, when he did a wonderful thing. As soon as he made any money in the theater, he established an off-Broadway playhouse, which he called theater 66 or theater whatever the year was and I did a play there and I guess he saw it and he had Dick Barr who was his producer then say to me Edward wants you to be in his next play so don't cut your hair so I didn't cut my hair for a long, long time. I still don't cut it very much. <laughs> I think it's better to have a long hair. I never had to audition for Edward in any way. The play came to where I lived, and um, I read it. It's a wonderful play, A Delicate Balance. And I remember when I was walking to the first read-through of it, it wasn't even a rehearsal. It was just the cast coming together to read the play. I remember thinking, this must have been how it was for a young actress going to the reading of a Chekhov play or an Ibsen play. That's how highly I thought of Edward's writing, and still do. And if you ask me about my relationship with him, it's based on the work on the plays but it also has become a great friendship because he is a perfect friend. He really cares about the people in his plays and the people in his life. And we're back to the question of confidence again. Mm -hmm. It gives me confidence that I can do Edward's plays and I love them and I go to see the plays he does that I'm not in. I thought the revival of A Delicate Balance was wonderful. I thought the revival of Virginia Woolf was heart-stopping, wonderful. I've seen a new play of his called Me, Myself, and I about Siamese twins, or real twins, not Siamese twins. I think his, he's so imaginative and so daring, and he wants to say to the audience, Live your life better. Live a better life. That's, that, that, I think, is Edward's message. The roles that he's written with you in mind, I guess they've written with you in mind. No, no, no. No, they're no just he'll be the first to tell you. I thought, I thought he wrote, because of what Dick Barr said to me about the part in the play of A Delicate Balance, I thought he, I misunderstood him, and I thought he wrote it for me. And I wrote that in a book I wrote about the theater. And he said to me, I didn't write it for you. I don't ever write for a specific actress. How well, interesting. I, I couldn't take it out of the book. It's still there. <laughs> <laughs> so if you read the book, you'll think, well, Edward Albee wrote a part for her. No, he no. didn't. I thought we would go out on uh, your characterization from uh, the Metropolitan Opera of the uh, no, I don't know that it's from uh, La Fille du Régiment. It is indeed. By Donizetti, am I it correct? Is, it is. And it's uh, the Baroness or the Duchesse. But I don't sing a note. I have to tell you quickly, otherwise you'd put your hands over your ears. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, it's an acting part. It's an acting part in an mm -hmm. opera.
Merci. Bonjour, Aimé. Ah, Duchesse, je ne vous attendais presque plus. Ah oui, eh bien moi, j'ai presque failli attendre. J'ai presque été mouillé. J'ai presque failli cacher ma chaussure debout en sortant de le Bentley. Oh. J'attendais votre attendant qui, lui, ne l'attendait pas. Entends-tu ce enfin Mais... Laissez-nous, nous réglerons cela plus tard. Mais j'ai dit... Laissez-nous, on vous dit. Disparaissez Get out How quickly time has passed, Marion. It's amazing. They tell me we have to bring this part uh, to a close. I, I wish to thank you and our home audience for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon for part two of my conversation with Marion Seldes.